afternoon, and welcome to uh, RBC Disruptors. I'm glad people laughed. Comedy is always, uh, always brutal. Uh, I'm John Stackhouse. It's my pleasure to hold our monthly conversations on technology and how it's changing everything around us. If you're joining us on WebEx or on Facebook Live, uh, welcome. Special shout out to a group in Winnipeg at the uh, North Forge Technology Exchange who are uh, have, watching us as a, uh, a team today. So welcome to, uh, to you out there in uh, Winnipeg. Today we're joined by an incredible leader in technology who almost needs no introduction, Stuart Butterfield, the founder and CEO of Slack. Stuart, welcome to RBC and RBC Disruptors. Thank you, thanks for having great, me. Great to have you here. Uh, Stuart's story is incredible. We're gonna talk about what he's doing at Slack. We're gonna get a bit of his own history, some of the lessons he's learned. Uh, can't let it pass without a bit about your upbringing. Born in a fishing village in Vancouver Island in the woods. First five years of his life without technology or without electricity. Yep. Hard to have technology without electricity. Uh, studied at the University of Victoria and then philosophy at Cambridge University. So we'll hear a bit more about that. Went on to uh, create Flickr. I remember Flickr. Mm -hmm. Not sure everyone here does. Uh, created Whatever. a couple, couple, some couple younger of younger people. A couple of gaming companies and then, of course, uh, Slack. So, uh, Stuart, as I say, welcome to uh, the conversation. It's great to spend uh, some, time, some time with you. Thank you. And you're trying to reinvent office uh, and collaboration culture as we uh, poked a bit of fun at there in the video. Let's start first with Slack, though. I think you've even admitted that it's kind of hard to explain. So I want to give you a crack here at explaining what is Slack. All right. Um, I had this experience... Um like about a year and a half ago. I was at a dinner and there's a bunch of CEOs at this event and I was explaining what Slack was to the person to my left who was the CEO of a French beverage conglomerate. And I was about like maybe three or four minutes into the explanation, pretty esoteric, pretty convoluted. And someone leaned across the table and said, it replaces email inside your company. And he said, oh. <laughs> so um, that was a much better explanation than the one that I attempted. But there's two... Um, aspects to that. The first is just on the communication side, and obviously that's principally what we use email for, what we think of with, with email. Um, email is a, a very important tool and be around for a long time. I think it's also a terrible choice as the primary means of communication inside of an organization, because the virtue of email is that it um, crosses organizational boundaries, that it's lowest common denominator, and I mean that in, in a positive way. You can expect that everyone in the world more or less has an email address and you'll be able to reach them that way. Um, but many of you will have started here at RBC in the last year, in the last five years, in the last 10 years, and on your first day of the job in your RBC inbox, you had nothing, despite the fact that there might have been tens, hundreds of millions, maybe billions of messages exchanged before you got there, you're cut off from that whole history. And obviously, no one's gonna read three billion um, messages, but having them available for search and having the specific communications that happened in your work group, in your department, in your functional area, in your business unit, in your office location, having those available um, when you start and having access to that archive would, would be very valuable. Um, so email is designed around individuals, so kind of individual first communication. Slack is designed around teams or organizations, so it's team first communication. And rather than having the messages kind of a partial fragmented copy of the conversations in your inbox, conversations happen in what we call channels, and those channels are accessible to everyone. So that's one. You can see I answered questions in a very extensive, <laughs> uh, long-winded way. The other part is email as a platform. And um, uh, one of our board members once described email as the window through which all workflows across the company are made visible to the employees, and it's actually pretty accurate. So you have Outlook or whatever it is you use, and that's kind of your window to what's going on across the company. If there's an acquisition or a divestiture, if there's an executive change that's announced to you in that way, if you work on contracts or documents, the documents are going back and forth with red lines via email, um, if you have to approve someone's expense report or purchase order, you receive that notification in email. It's kind of this platform, and we don't see email as a platform, um, you know, and, and maybe as the one universal platform across the organization because we're like fish swimming in the, in the email sea. So salespeople can be heads down in Salesforce and HR people in Workday, um, finance people in Oracle or NetSuite or whatever. Um, but email is the thing that, that's common uh, across all of them. So Slack also replaces that aspect of email, and unlike email, is designed specifically to be able to do that. So there's a set of APIs that are available. Um, we have integrations with pretty much every enterprise software company, so 
partnerships with SAP and IBM and Oracle, um, but also the kind of the next generation ServiceNow, Workday, Box, Okta, and um, in addition to the 1500 third party applications like the ones I just mentioned available in the Slack app directory, there's also about 200,000 developers around the world who are active on a weekly basis creating integrations um, inside of customer companies. So building their internal tools, their line of business applications, creating interfaces for those inside of Slack. And you've got, I, I, I should say to the audience, both uh, here in person and watching on Facebook or WebEx, join the conversation through uh, Facebook Live, share your questions or comments. We'll get to those on the screen here through, the, uh, through this conversation. You've got a vision though, Stuart, for what kind of the, the, the world of work should be like. Uh, and it's, it's about more than tools. As we watched in the video, we've probably all been in meetings like that over the last, uh, over the last number of days. That's pretty typical. What should collaboration look like? What do you want it to look like? Um, well, what we'd like is to help organizations, teams, work groups, uh, whatever, achieve a higher degree of alignment and clarity. And there's this interesting thing. Um, if you divide the world, and this isn't perfectly accurate, but just divide the world into the workers and the bosses for a moment. If you ask the workers what they want um, in the context of work, of course, They'll say they would like to be trusted and they would like to be respected and they'd like to be able to trust and respect the people that they work with. They would like a degree of autonomy. They would like to be able to make some of their own decisions. But if they can't make a decision, critically, they would like to know who can make that decision. They would like to understand what the objectives are and have some clarity around the goals. Um, if you ask the bosses what they want, it's going to be exactly the same thing using slightly different language. So talking about accountability, um, having people on the same page. And most of us who have had more than a couple of years job experience have seen the difference between the best and the worst performing teams, or at least some well-performing teams and some poorly performing teams. Um, and it's night and day. I mean, the, assuming that you're hiring for some baseline level of competence, the difference between the best and the worst performing individuals is, you know, uh, is something, um, but it's not that huge. The difference between the best and the worst performing teams is, is mm. enormous. And a large part of that has to do with the degree of clarity um, and, and alignment. So anything we can do to help increase that, and, and Slack obviously doesn't solve any of those things for any customers. It's just an effective instrument for the solution. But it, it, it enables clarity. That's a great way of uh, putting yeah. it. Uh, and, and that facilitates uh, collaboration. We'll come back to uh, how, how, that, uh, how Slack does that, but I want to get a bit of insight on your own journey. Take us back actually to, uh, to, to the beginning. As I mentioned, you grew up uh, or were raised initially in, uh, in the woods. Curious how you ended up in t uh, technology, especially after studying philosophy. Um, there's a lot there. So my parents were hippies. My dad was from New York. My mom was from Montreal. They met on the McGill campus in 1969 or 1970. Um, they moved out west and um, you know, because it was 1970, had the naive belief that um, they could live off the land. Like I said, my dad's from New York, my mom's from Montreal, so they had no idea what they were doing at all. <laughs> Moved to like a coastal rainforest and try to grow wheat. Um, <laughs> and not be like kind of aware that each of those things was its own specialty. You know, there's people who have the last name Miller because milling wheat is its <laughs> own thing, and you can't just assume that you're going to do all of that. So they grew a lot of zucchini, and I assume that I ate a lot of zucchini when I was a kid. Um, but when I was five, we moved to Victoria, which was like the, the big city, um, so that I could go to school. And fast forward, um, so I was born in 1973, that's 1978 when we would have arrived in Victoria. Fast forward a couple years, and um, when I was in second grade, my uh, elementary school class was the first class in that school, or I think in that school district, to get computers in the classroom. And we also um, got a computer at home, an Apple IIe, and taught myself coding. So I was really enthusiastic about computers when I was young. Um, I would write terrible video games. There was a magazine called Byte, which published yeah. um, programs in the back, a couple of pages, and you could just copy them out. Uh, and to be honest, that kind of that waned um, as I got older. So through high school, I just was less and less interested until I arrived at the University of Victoria in 1992 and got an account on the school's Unix machine. And exposure to the internet just blew my mind. It was really, um, like for me anyway, it's occurred as like a as profound a shift as has ever happened in the history of the species. And that might sound overblown or exaggerated, 
but like the development of written language mm -hmm. is like one amazing moment that completely transformed us as a species. And there's been a handful of other ones. And I think the development of the internet, the ability to kind of transcend geography, to transcend social groupings um, is a really, really important one. And anyone who's listening, who's you know maybe 25 or 30 or older is, and I, I didn't make this up myself, but um, is in this, the last generation of human beings that will know life both before and after the internet. Um, that knowledge will disappear because everyone for the next 100,000 generations or however long the species persists is gonna have something like um, that internet. And that really reignited my interest in technology. In this case, more the use of computing technology to facilitate human interaction. And I was studying philosophy. Um, it's Anglo-American analytic philosophy, so less what people think of when they think about philosophy, not like your philosophy of life and not like Derrida and Foucault kind of French philosophy, but super, super dry, super, super boring. Um, like no one would ever want to talk about it at a dinner party kind of um, analytic philosophy. And so specifically as an undergrad, I studied logic and philosophy of mind and then graduate school philosophy of biology. Um, but that was also really intertwined with the history of computing. So um, computer science before it was its own discipline was usually conducted either in mathematics departments or philosophy departments. And um, I was really interested in the underpinnings of, of computers, um, the kind of the John von Neumann, Alan Turing history. And that had no real practical ramifications, but um, that interest in the internet, I think was something that really changed my life because that was 92. It's a little bit before the web uh, became a phenomenon, before the web kind of took off. And so when the web did take off a year or so later, I taught myself HTML as one of the few people around me anyway who could make websites. And that became my summer job all the way through um, university. And then there's this critical moment for me in 1998 where I had just finished my master's degree and I was enrolled, I was set to start the PhD and um, the dot-com boom had started and so I had two sets of friends, one in the academic world who were getting their first jobs that they hated, that were very poor pain, you know, very little job security, you had a recessional, you had to renew every nine months. Um, and the people who are moving to San Francisco and making like twice as much money and it's this crazy dynamic environment where everyone's changing the world and so I left. And, uh, and what is that, 20 yep. years later, here I am. And if we can quickly jump forward to Flickr, I'd like to get a quick insight on where that came from. So both Flickr and Slack um, were pivots away from the initial project of the companies and in both cases, the companies were founded to build web-based massively multiplayer games. And so that seems very, very different. Um, massively multiplayer game on one side, enterprise software on the other, or massively multiplayer game on one side, photo sharing side on the other. The uniting characteristic from my perspective is that use of computing technology to facilitate human interaction. So I'm not a, an especially big gamer. Um, I don't play a lot of console or PC games. And the games that we were making were much more esoteric, and you can see why they were not commercially viable in a second. Um, but like no combat, no fighting, cooperative, creative, a little bit of like Dr. Seuss meets Monty Python, surreal mm. world. A niche audience that was very enthusiastic about it, but definitely not, um, not widespread. But the principal part of it was, it was like the shared world that people were creating together. Anyone could interact with anyone else. It was, in, in technical terms, we say uncharted, so everyone was playing in the same world. And the step from there to what someone um, at Yahoo, the company that ended up buying Flickr, called massively multiplayer photo sharing was actually not that great, because mm -hmm. Flickr was the first uh, photo sharing site um, or the first you know, one that, that took off in the spaces where you could make your photos public and people could comment on them and you could form groups. Um, and that was very different than what was happening before, which was principally about um, uh, online websites that would let you order prints of, of photos. So you could share them, but you would share them privately with a small group in the hopes that they would order four by six or five by seven prints. And um, that, that really changed things and Slack, Again, obviously very different than a massively multiplayer game, but it's massively multiplayer workplace software. And I think that was one of the, um, I mean, I wish that we 
knew all this in advance. This is all post facto rationalization for how things turned out. But in all cases, it's the same. You have an identity you're able to interact with and send messages to people across the system. It's um, simple and flexible enough to, uh, to be able to model a really complex arrangement. And, and as a result, we have people using Slack in um, restaurants and farms, police departments, state and local government, um, like the city of Stockholm administration runs on Slack and the Hartford, Connecticut Police Department runs on Slack and a number of um, great restaurants, mostly in the Bay Area, um, run on Slack, but it's, it's around the world and it's like huge corporations, about two thirds of the Fortune 100, um, but it's also used by 500,000 different kinds of organizations from student clubs and research labs um, to here at RBC. So you mentioned with Flickr was a pivot and Slack was a pivot. Where did the idea come from in your mind for the pivot for Slack? Um, well, we got up to about 45 people and we worked on this game for three and a half years and it was this really credible technology and there's a whole bunch of interesting creative stuff. Um, but we had a system for internal communication which was based on an ancient internet technology called IRC. So IRC stands for Internet Relay Chat. It was one of the things that I discovered in 1992 when I first got online because it, it dates from about 89, 1989. Um, and uh, it, very popular among open source developers, um, kind of popular in the internet community when the internet community was a thing as opposed to all of you know, four and a half billion people. Um, and IRC is very much like Slack, but very deficient in the sense of the requirements of modern workforces because it was so old. So over the course of several years, we just made little additions and fixed um, uh, small annoying aspects of it, made small improvements, looked for opportunities to, um, to help with internal communication. And I think this is really important, not in a conscious way, so we didn't, talk about it, this thing didn't have a name, we didn't deliberately try to spend time on it, it was something that we did in the background. And the reason I think that's important is because there was no ego or speculation involved in, in the design process, which there almost always is. Uh, you, people can't help it, but become attached to their, their own ideas. But because this was just trying to solve for the things that we found difficult in internal communication, this system evolved over the course of those years to be something that we thought was really great and when we decided to shut down the game, we would realize we would never work without a system like this again, and it was a pretty short hop from there to probably other people would like it. We've got a related question here coming in from uh, Facebook, which is how you initially pitched Slack to your team. Are they skeptical? Um, no, I think there's actually there's a pretty high degree of enthusiasm, because we uh, all wanted to continue to, working, to, to work together. Um, we actually had money left from our investors. We decided to shut the game down when we realized that it wasn't going to work as opposed to when we were completely out of money. Um, everyone was really enthusiastic about the system that we were using and, and agreed that this would, like, was a big step forward. I don't think we really had a sense of how big it would be, so we thought that the, kind of the, the, the whole total addressable market for Slack and kind of like the, the, um, the thing that we are aiming for was to get to about $100 million in revenue and thereby be a billion dollar company. And we blew past that inside of two years. So it was a much bigger opportunity than we realized. It was much more widespread. It was a much larger group of people who would find it useful. And I think we were, when we started it, an eight person software development team and we thought this will be perfect for other eight person software development teams as opposed to this will work for, um, you know, over 100,000 daily active users at IBM, or this will work uh, all over the world. So one of the amazing things in my mind about the Slack story is how fast it grew in the first year. There was a spark there, it spread like wildfire. When you look back, that's only four years ago. Mm -hmm. what, uh, what was it initially that sparked? Um, it, it takes a little while. Like, so the, f the first five um, other teams, other than the team that created Slack, who we got to use it took months of like convincing people, going back, showing them again, trying to explain why they would do this because uh, it's not a category that existed before um, in any way that was had, you know, had much consciousness. Um, most people didn't feel like they had any trouble with internal communication or at least any trouble that software could solve. And um, that, that part was really slow. Once people tried it, however, um, 
they almost universally stuck with it. Um, if it was being used by a work group inside of some larger organization, it almost inevitably grew inside that organization. So um, we, in, when we were working on the game, we had this problem where people would, you can get lots of people to try it and then they wouldn't stay. So that's often called a, a leaky bucket problem. You're not accumulating mm. users. Slack was the opposite. Um, not everyone who set up an instance was able to successfully get their team to, to use it with them and some of those would kind of wither on the vine. Um, but those who did get some of their colleagues to use it, very high rate of sticking with it um, and very strong growth inside of those organizations going forward. And it's still the same way. I mean, once organizations start using it, they see the advantages in such a profound way that they're very unlikely to stop. And um, when people switch jobs they, to a company that doesn't use Slack, um, they evangelize pretty heavily to say, we, gotta, we really want to use this. Um, we also have customers that were the result of acquisitions. So um, a big American retailer bought several companies that were Slack users um, and Slack infiltrated the organization in that way. So there's a little bit of just brownie in motion of people changing jobs and, and shifting around. Um, the critical thing though is that you know, all that's driven by love or love might be tend to um, there, there's a lot of love for Slack. Yeah, there's a lot it's, of love for Slack. One of the reasons it grew organically. Yeah, you've got those evangelists. That's and 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 the reason is it makes people more, makes the team more effective and more productive. And there's really you know all other things being equal, if you're working on some team um, you know where you expect the project to get canceled or it's working in opposition to some other team or it doesn't feel like this is very effective or important work, it sucks and you don't want to come to work in the morning kind of dread it. Um, on the other hand, if you feel like your work has a real impact and you're productive and you're working well with the team and, and things are happening, it's really exciting and you're excited to come to work in the morning. Um, and people like that feeling, so um, they don't always articulate it in that way. It's sometimes hard for people to explain why they think Slack is, is better, but that enthusiasm is what caused all the growth. So you had all those evangelists out there, I get that. I'm curious how difficult it was to get large organizations, uh, especially the first batch, to, to, uh, to sign on or to sign up. Well, it's, um, so we now have a great enterprise sales team and there's hundreds of people around the world. We have nine offices um, here in, in Toronto, but also in New York and Tokyo, Dublin, Melbourne. And- um, But you didn't we, have that in We didn't have one. that. We didn't have that in year one, but what we did have was people inside of the organizations kind of agitating for um, use. So, uh, did you see the agitators, or did it just? Oh yeah, kind of yeah, yeah. I mean, I remember going to. I apologize. I, I sometimes can't remember which company, but what customers I'm allowed to talk about, which ones I'm not allowed to talk about. So let's say a large American software company. Um, we went to go talk to them, and we knew we had friends there, um, and they started using Slack all over the place. There was three teams, then five teams, and then 10 teams, and there was 100 teams. Um, and almost all of those were unsanctioned officially. People would pay for them on their credit cards and get their managers to approve the expense. And they went from this problem of, I use Slack at company X, um, and I have a colleague who doesn't use Slack, to the, the inverse problem, which is, uh, there's so many teams inside this organization that I'm on like seven or eight different Slack instances and it's really confusing to try to remember who, where I messaged someone before. Um, with that kind of activity on the inside, the sales process becomes much easier because there's enormous pressure on procurement, on IT to, to make this work because the teams want it and why do the teams want it? Because they think it makes them much more effective. So um, at first it was a pretty like, uh, rough and ready, small small sales team that could go and, and get those deals signed. But now the same process exists. It's like there's a lot of small team usage inside of a company. Sometimes those teams will grow together and merge and there'll be a couple hundred people here and a couple hundred people there. Maybe it gets to a thousand or more. Um, and at some point the internal pressure to officially sanction the tool and to get like an enterprise license or to switch to the, our grid product um, pushes that, that conversation. So you've got nine million active users today. Curious what you've learned, uh, what you've learned from them. Um, well, an enormous amount. So we're obviously very hardcore users of our own product and um, because we put all the features in, we have pretty deep knowledge of them. I would say that we've probably invented 
10 or 15 percent of the best practices around how to use Slack, and the other 85 or 90 percent we've learned from watching customers. And we have a you know a, a predisposition to be more service oriented. I think we're big believers in the idea that in the long run the like the value of what we do will be determined by the amount of value that we create for our customers. And part of that is customer service. We have a great team around the world, 75-minute um, time to first response, 98% customer satisfaction rating. And that's, you know, we look at that as basically a marketing experience because if people are so happy with the service, they go on to tell people. But the other thing is it's this enormous surface area for receiving signal back from people. And that we have analytics and we can instrument the software, we can measure all kinds of things. But um, nothing compares to just hearing from people what the questions are. So if there's a you know a large number of questions about something, probably it's not clear. If there's a large number of complaints about something, either it's not clear or it's just wrong. And the team that manages that, you know, tens of thousands, or I don't even know at this point um, what the volume is like, but maybe hundreds of thousands of um, customer support tickets a month, a, a similar number of tweets, all of them handled one on one by an actual human. Um, are enormous signal that we can use to improve the quality of the product. Now you now have a number of large uh, large customers. You mentioned IBM, eBay, I believe, is a, a user. Maybe you can share some insights on how large organizations are creatively uh, using Slack. Um, well, it's often the. I mean, I'll, I'll give an example from our own usage, and we're not as big of a company. But I think the microcosm helps. Um, Oracle, the software company, is now our second biggest customer, and. Um, Last summer, uh, like maybe 14, 15 months ago, we were in the process of closing this deal. And so we have a sales organization we were just talking about. For each of the large customers, there's a Slack channel that's accounts-name of the company. So there was an accounts-oracle channel. And on the Oracle side, there was about 100 people involved in the process, from security, policy, procurement, IT, legal, the internal comms, the HR people working on change management. Just like, you know, it's, it gets pretty complicated at that level. And there's a couple dozen people on the Slack side who were um, dealing with it. And all that conversation happened in a channel that was, we say, public, so public inside of our Slack instance. And I never had to ask anyone, hey, what's up with Oracle? Where are we at in the process? No one ever had to generate a report for me or um, go out of their way. They would just talk in this channel. And everyone who was involved in that deal, the customer success team, solutions engineer, account executives, legal, um, they would give each other updates and ask each other questions in this channel. I could just look at it. They were all on the same page. There wasn't a lot of like daily stand-up meetings or updates or anything like that. But it goes beyond that because they weren't doing that for my benefit. That wasn't performative for the CEO. That was just their regular communication. And anyone else across the company could see it. So the other sales leaders and managers, the people on the finance team that were working on the ramifications of this, um, people on adjacent sales teams who were going through similar challenges could look in. Uh, software engineers who are working on some feature, the release of which was blocking deployment for some part of Oracle, got the context. And if you think about like uh, Dilbert and the pointy-haired boss, or the movie Office Space, or TV show The Office, or the kind of common tropes of um, corporate life, it's often this disaffectation or alienation um, that people feel due to not understanding the context. To feeling like this is a decision that came from corporate or something like that. To feeling cut off from the um, from understanding the, the motivations and, and the rationale, and that doesn't happen, you know, and, th and that's a pretty profound change. So inside of the largest organizations, we see exactly the same phenomenon. I think, you know, maybe IBM, because it's so big, there's a couple of special cases. They have uh, centers of excellence that essentially exist on Slack, which didn't exist otherwise. Um, or, or didn't exist in as robust a form, like all of the front-end engineers across IBM, and there's thousands and thousands of them who are in India and Germany and Austin, Texas, and Raleigh, North Carolina, now had this one place to share design patterns and techniques and libraries they were using, and that really accelerated that and, and formed a, a deeper um, sense of community among those people. But a lot of it was just the same stuff that I was talking mm -hmm. about. Another question here from Facebook on the, the, the biggest challenge you face in growing uh, your user base and how did you navigate that? Um, so there's, I mean, it's hard to, to, to know which is the biggest. Uh, there's a management challenge which is the company growing so fast. So we were eight people when we first started accepting 
kind of beta customers in 2013. We were probably 25 or 30 people when we officially launched in February of 2014. We're now uh, 1,300 people. Um, and so there's many years in which we doubled. Um, there was one year, I think it was 2015, where we doubled twice, like from 80 people to 160 and 160 to 320. And um, that may sound hard, but when you think about the reality of that, go to an all hands meeting and say, how many of you have been to the company for less than three months? And like 20, 25% of the hands would go up. How many of you have been here for less than six months? And like 50%-ish would put their hands up. And how many of you have been here for less than a year? 75% would put their hand up. And that's crazy. Like, the, you know, you think about the average tenure inside of some specific team, like a two-person Android development team that's suddenly now eight people, six of whom have been there, you know, nine months, six months, two months. Um, I'm grateful for the fact that the wheels didn't come off. So there's, all, there's other stuff. There's technical challenges, there's operational challenges, legal, financial, opening other offices, all of that kind of stuff. But I think nothing compares to the challenges around growing the organization at that size and keeping people uh, aligned. So some of the platform companies would argue that they've got uh, similar offerings. Mm -hmm. Curious what your competitive advantage is and how you, uh, how you compete with them at scale. Well, we don't really have that much competition. I mean, the, some of the platform companies, Microsoft. Um, and there's the only didn't want to name names. Yeah, okay. But I mean, the only company no. that really that that directly competes. Um, so the competitive advantage at this point is this is what we do and this is what we're focused on, and um, and we're several years ahead on the product side. So if you think that this product category sounds like something you're interested in, there's only really one choice at this point, which is which is Slack. Um, and um, I don't mean to sound dismissive of it, and I think that it's good that there's customer choice and, and that there'll be continued innovation on both sides. But um, when I talk about com customers of, of Slack that are using Slack with 10,000, 20, 50, 100,000 daily active users, that's only possible because we have a product called Enterprise Grid, which allows you to federate multiple teams together and share channels between them. Microsoft doesn't have that yet. Uh, there's a hard limit on the number of participants. Um, they're really, really good, really powerful, really smart, um, and I think a great organization, especially like this generation of Microsoft, and I have a lot of respect for, for Satya and, and that team. So I think they'll, be, they'll catch up on, on the product side. And then the, uh, a lot of the competition shifts to which is more attractive or valuable as a platform. And I mentioned earlier partnerships we have with um, SAP and Oracle and IBM, but also ServiceNow, Workday, Salesforce. Uh, that's going to make a real difference because any one vendor, and it doesn't matter if you're Microsoft or SAP, Oracle, um, over time in, in the current world delivers a ever diminishing percentage of the total software value to customers and ever receives an ever diminishing percentage of the total software spend. Not because they're doing anything wrong, but because software just continues to proliferate deeper and deeper in, into smaller and smaller categories. I don't know the exact number, but I would bet my entire net worth that um, this bank buys software from more than 1,000 different vendors. Because we're only a 1,300 person company, we buy software from 350 different vendors. Mm. So that proliferation is gonna continue forever. There's a couple of things that really feel dominant or top of mind depending on what your um, job function is. But the universal one is gonna be email um, and maybe spreadsheets. Um, so Outlook and Excel. And those are loom very large in people's minds, but if you're a software developer, depending on, on what environment, what platform, GitHub is obviously very important. If you're a salesperson, then Salesforce is very important. If you're a marketer, it could be Marketo or HubSpot um, are, are very important. If you work on um, performance advertising, then your ad server and your ad buy-in tools will become very important. And I keep going forever with the number of categories, like an Apple can tracking system for recruiters um, and, and finance tools. Um, the number and depth of integrations that each platform has is gonna be probably the biggest determining factor on the overall value delivered to customers, so we're really committed to um, extending those partnerships and deepening them. 
curious how you think about scale. Nine million users is extraordinary, but I think I've read a comment from you that you think there are 200 million, if that's the right number, uh, potential users out there. Mm -hmm. Curious how you get from 10 million roughly to 200 million. How do you onboard them? Uh, uh, and, a lot of hard work. A lot, a lot of work, yeah, so obviously, but how, and, and how long does that take? Well, let's see if we're successful first, but um, there's probably something like 600 million knowledge workers ex China, and, and for various reasons, China's not a, um, a market for us. Of those, I think you could really restrict it to the um, people who spend a couple of hours sitting down in front of a computer each day um, is, is like the, the key market, or people who um, use email to get their work done. So when I use those characteristics, I'm saying, you know, Probably not most retail workers, not most food service workers. Um, it excludes a large number of people in healthcare, for example. Uh, so that's a very big market. And how do we grow? I mean, the same way that we're doing it now, which is more and more international expansion. We just made Slack available in French, German, and Spanish um, last September, and then Japanese in November. Japan's our second biggest market around the world. Um, and I think Germany is fourth. Um, but we have no office in Germany, and France is going to be probably sixth. We have no office in France. So a lot of it is just that kind of mm. stuff, making it available in local languages, offering support in those languages, opening office, building sales teams, actually marketing it in, in those countries because we um, haven't marketed very much outside the U.S. And the other one is um, more and more support for specific Industry specific vertical, verticals, specific regulatory um, environments. So, um, for regulated customers in financial services, there's FINRA compliance. FINRA itself, like the actual organization, is a customer of, of ours, and um, as are a number of insurance companies and, and retail banks and um, hedge funds. So it's a lot of just work. Um, mm -hmm. There's no there's no magic ingredient there, but making Slack available to a wider and wider audience. Take another question here from Facebook about uh, th the future of Slack, uh, and especially in light of the acquisition of uh, Astro. And maybe you can give a bit more a broader insight yeah. as well in terms of how is AI going to uh, maybe redirect Slack. All right. So Astro is a company that we just announced the acquisition of last week or maybe the week before. Um, and they had made uh, AI-powered email and calendaring tools. So the, the real driver for us was... Um, email as a bridge to parts of the organization that aren't currently using Slack to make it easier for people to participate in those conversations and kind of um, allow blended workplaces because that's the reality for, for most organizations. Um, but the work that they had done in machine learning was interesting for us. We have a group called Search Learning and Intelligence in New York, an office we opened a couple of years ago, um, who do all the work on the, the search engine. But the search problem and um, the data that people have, or our customers have in Slack, um, present a lot of interesting opportunities. So I'll give just one quick example. There's a whole bunch. But when people do a search, they're typically kind of one of two things going on. So one, there's a document or a message that they um, believe or um, expect exists, and they're trying to retrieve it. So like I saw someone give me a presentation last week. I want to go find it again. Or sometimes it's even like, I said something about this to someone and I want to go find that message. The other one is, I would like to know about this topic. I would like to know about this programming language or this customer or this um, feature that's under development. And so I type in that name. And for those type of searches, it's um, a really interesting area to try to find both venues or, or channels where that topic is discussed frequently um, or people who appear to be experts on that topic. And you can imagine this here, this company, companies all around the world, there's a huge volume of questions that are like, how do I, and then fill in the blank with like, change the registered address on my RSP or something like that, um, or who do I talk to about whatever? And those, those, um, those kinds of questions, I think, seeking information or, or seeking who can make a decision or who's the expert in, in a particular topic are like an enormous volume, like probably double digit percentage of what goes on inside of large organizations. So investments in how we can leverage the data that's in Slack in order to better answer those kinds of questions in an area that we're, we're super interested in. So you mentioned in passing that China is off limits for you. Why? Um, we're an American-based messaging company. You know, so uh, I think it would be very 
unlikely that we would have permission, like official sanction to operate there without um, the government having access to message data, which is obviously not something that's either possible or desirable for us. Other question here from Facebook. You've talked about your international expansion, and the question is, if you had to start over again, would you choose the Valley as your headquarters, <sighs> home a, base? It's a really tough one. Um, so yes, is the short answer. Um, I'm a patriotic Canadian um, and um, spent, spent historically most of my time in our Vancouver office, which is about 100 people. Um, I'm going to our Toronto office this afternoon uh, doing a company-wide all hands from, from that location. Here's the challenge. So when it comes to engineers, designers, salespeople, marketers, finance, um, I think that there's a, uh, the talent is more or less equally distributed across North America. I mean, we could have offices in the Midwest. We have a, we're just opening an office in Denver right now, so it could be in the, on the western side. It could be in the south. It could be in the Maritimes. It could be in Alberta. Um, but when we think about hiring in, in um, let's say, Vancouver when we were first getting started, while there's plenty of great software engineering talent, there um, are essentially no people who would make great candidates for <coughs> vice presidents of enterprise sales. Like in the Bay Area, because of the prevalence and concentration of those companies, and you think about all like the senior directors of sales or regional managers or, or regional vice presidents or whatever, at all of those big enterprise software companies, they're all candidates. And in Vancouver, there literally might be five people. I, mean, I don't even know if there are, are five, and that might sound exaggerated, but for, for kind of specialized executive talent, if there's not enough industry in that place, why would someone happen to be there? Um, like they're retired and, and they chose to live there for, for lifestyle. Um, there's not a lot of investment bankers in, and I don't want to choose any particular city in Canada, in case there's someone that that's their hometown. But the reality is like there's, there's not a lot of um, investment makers in any town with a population of less than 10,000 people in, in Canada. Like, cause why, how would you possibly end up there? There's no job opportunities there. Um, so that's not um, a criticism of places outside the Bay Area, but the concentration of talent and the depth of the network is something that's more or less impossible to, to overcome anywhere else. It, one of the criticisms of the Valley and Valley culture is, yes, it's incredibly deep, uh, but it's also very narrow. There's not a great diversity of, of, of thought. You can, uh, you can disagree if you want, but I, I'm curious from your own perspective, having studied philosophy, what are some of the critical uh, aspects or th aspects of critical thinking that you see lacking in the Valley that maybe you developed in your own, in your own education? That's a great question. So there's two parts. So one is um, headquartered in the Valley, I think is something that's important for us, especially as when we're a younger company. If we live up to our ambitions and we become much, much larger, I don't think it really matters so much where we're, we're headquartered because the company can move anywhere. And also, we already are committed to expanding all around the world. Um, if there's a shortcoming that's specific to the Valley, um, I mean, there's more of a shortcoming specific to living in, in the Valley or living in San Francisco, which is it's uh, a geographic area that's so completely dominated by one industry that it becomes a much less interesting place to live. Um, so in contrast to, to New York, where I get to spend some time, in contrast to Toronto, which is an amazing city, um, there's just tech. Like, there, there isn't publishing, there isn't finance, there isn't media, um, there's almost no art because the artists can't afford to live there. Um, there's no vibrant immigrant communities in, in San Francisco. Um, it's really just like a one industry town and, and as a result of that kind of a monoculture. So I'm not sure if that leads to fallacious thinking. Um, there is a, a, you know, a real uh, dominance of one view of the world and one kind of way to spend your time, your finite time on this planet, which is about starting tech companies and, and making money. Um, so I don't know that I would recommend it as a place to live other than that opportunity. And I think people don't, no one moves to San Francisco be, or Silicon Valley because they just wanted to live there and they're gonna do something else, right? They move there because they're excited about the industry and it's dynamic and um, it's fascinating problems to work on and they can strike it rich and they want to be an entrepreneur or whatever. Whereas people move here because it's an amazing city. People move to New York because it's an amazing city. People move to London or Tokyo because they're amazing cities. And long term, I think that's a disadvantage. 
It's interesting, isn't it? Because people used to move to San Francisco decades ago because it was an interesting place yeah, to, uh, absolutely. to live. Absolutely. Another question here from Facebook, will, will, from, obviously from a user, will Slack ever have groups that uh, people can follow to learn from thought leaders? There's a lot of kind of community usage of Slack, which is not the, what we design for. Uh, it's not something that we discourage, but Slack is best as a tool um, for some group of people that are aligned around the accomplishment of some goal or a set of goals. And it doesn't have to be business related. Um, Slack is wildly popular in the Bay Area among wedding planners because there's like a group of people, the florists, the caterer, the people at the venue, the musicians, the, the couple who, the, who are trying to like make a whole bunch of decisions and stay coordinated towards some f rapidly approaching deadline. Um, same thing with home renovation projects and stuff like that. But as a tool that would be used to connect people who, whose only commonality is that they like Star Trek or something like that, not, not a great tool. Um, so um, if there's a community that's dedicated to learning um, and interacting with thought leadership and there's really active moderation and, and management of that organization, it, it may be successful. It's certainly not gonna come from us. Um, but it, it can also just, you know, because it's, it's really designed for teams, um, it's not a necessarily a great tool for communities. Do you see a way to change that? Um, I mean, yeah, we could, but... Uh, or is that called but, Facebook? Yeah, exactly. I mean, the, not everything has to do everything. Yeah. You've talked about building empathy at scale. What does that, uh, what does that mean? Um, so I mentioned our support team earlier, um, the onboarding program. Well, first of all, we make that a real job, right? Like it has a good salary and there's a career path and there's development opportunities and there's like, it's a, it's a rich organization that doesn't just do call center kind of customer support ticketing, but writes all the documentation and does design certification programs for users and training modules. And um, so part of it is like, when I think about that team and what it's like to start there and the internal onboarding for those employees, it's really about, um, going to the extreme of putting customers first. And there's, um, there's a lot of other businesses that have been really good at that historically. Um, I think about a well-run restaurant or hotel, and I don't necessarily mean an expensive one, but just one that's well-run. It's about the customer. It's about um, creating an experience for them. Um, a nice, more well-run restaurant pays attention to things like the noise levels and the design of the room so noise doesn't bounce around too much. Um, and um, that kind of service orientation or putting the, you know, I want to put it this way, whatever someone thinks is how Slack is supposed to work is um, the right way of thinking about it. And to the extent that we deviate from that, um, that's our problem and not theirs. So if someone asks a question in a customer support ticket, it is, completely unacceptable to, to say they're an idiot because they couldn't figure this out. It's what are we doing wrong that they couldn't figure this out. Um, and software is notoriously hard to design um, and it's so abstract and conceptual that it can be difficult to understand. So the, um, putting ourselves in the, in the shoes of our users is something that not just in the support team but in um, engineering, in product, in design, in sales. Uh, and you know, it's funny, I. I didn't have a lot of experience in sales as an industry when I, um, when I first started this, but when I got exposed to the first great salespeople I met, um, one of them pointed out that the, the role of a salesperson is to listen very intently to what customers are saying, as opposed to try to bang something into their head and convince them. Um, because if you can't do that, you're never gonna, you know, you can badger someone into buying your thing um, sometimes but you're not gonna build a successful partnership over the long run, and that's obviously what we're looking for. So that, that empathy really applies across the company. I think your comment about monoculture might have uh, prompted another question here about what Slack is doing to address diversity, and particularly at the executive and board level. Um, casting our net wide in hiring, so we're, you know, uh, we're continuing to hire executives, but I'd say that we've added two independent directors and the first um, members of the board of directors, I'm, I'm the first one. Um, and for a You're while, allowed that. Yeah, well, yeah, so I, I was sole director for a little while, and then we um, did an investment round, and one of the representatives of the investors joined the board, and now we had two people on the board. And, and that continued. Um, 
until we had four directors, three of whom were representatives of the, the VCs. Um, as the company matures and, um, and gets more complicated, we started adding independent directors. And um, one thing people would notice about the four directors before we added any, any independents were they were all men. Um, so me and three venture capitalists. Mm -hmm. um, the first two independents that we added were both women. So one was um, Sarah Fryer, who's the CFO of a company called Square, um, who's one of the, I'd say one of the best executives I've ever met in my life. And because um, the CEO of Square also happens to be the CEO of Twitter, she really is a much more dynamic and engaged CFO um, than you would find it in most companies. Um, and the second one was a woman named Edith Cooper, who um, was a partner at, at Goldman Sachs for 20 years. and. Um, left the company as the head of their, what they call human capital management, so the head of people for uh, a 35,000 person company that had been through a lot over the last couple of decades. So a real um, depth of experience there. It's interesting, we're gonna have to add more independent directors. I feel like we could add all women the whole time um, and end up with an amazing board. We touched briefly on some of the uh, the culture challenges in the Valley, and, and obviously there's been a public display and great public, important public debate around a number of companies, Slack not being one of them. I'm curious how you inoculate your culture from those Wait, greater challenges. Look at this question. What is it? What, make that a little bit more real for me. So if we look at uh, some of the companies that have been in the news about, uh, about their culture, uh, a lot of that has been tagged to the Valley. And I'm curious how, as a CEO and founder, when you look at your own organization, how you ensure that it's, uh, um, it's, it's uh, have immune great, to some of those forces. Well, I wouldn't say immune, but I mean, um, there's a huge amount of self-selection at play, right? So um, we committed to building a diverse and inclusive organization really early, and that meant that we attracted people to whom that was important. Um, and so there wasn't some magic culture thing that we did. Um, as the company grew, um, A, it was more diverse than the typical tech company, but it also attracted a, 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 a type of person for whom that was a more important issue. So um, not immune, but it's, it's um, kind of like an increasing return dynamic. So once you start moving in this direction, it becomes easier and easier to move in this direction as opposed to it gets harder and harder as you get bigger. Um, I will say this though, that the, I don't think that there's any, when you say cultural problems, I mean, let's say sexism, racism, or just people being jerks inside the company. Um, those are the big ones. It's a, the United States is, and sorry, I'm a patriotic Canadian, but Canada too, they're just racist countries still. I mean, there's, there's, um, there's real systemic problems and it's a sexist society. So no one can expect those things to stop when you enter one building. They're not gonna stop when you come in the front door of Slack because we exist in this, in this whole world. And so um, I think it's totally fair for people to call out problems that are happening in tech companies. I think it's ridiculous to imagine that that's somehow unique to the tech industry and it's not in commercial real estate and it's not in medical equipment sales and it's not in the military and it's not in finance because it is. Um, and I think that's a, it's a, this is not allowed to suggest that, that people in the tech industry should not be held accountable or um, that they shouldn't be important issues. But I, I think it's something that, and I, I feel like we're at the very beginning now, even though it's 2018, in really addressing those things um, at the level of, of the society. And even just the stuff that's in the news this week and, and last week, um, I think show that there's some pretty deep divides and, um, and ways of thinking that probably won't survive the next generation. Yeah, well, that's a really important point. A lot of these challenges, are, m most of them are societal, not uh, sectoral. I wonder if you can t uh, t touch on your values, which are, uh, which are fascinating, courtesy, playfulness, and craftsmanship, just to pick three very different from any other corporate values I've, I've heard. Yeah. So like a lot of people, I, I was very influenced by the Netflix culture deck, the original mm -hmm. one. There's like actually a whole updated thing that they, they changed in a pretty profound way. But one of the things that I liked about it was in the beginning, um, they held up three values. And unfortunately, I'm forgetting the third one, but they were excellence, integrity, and something else. And 
Um, and then you flip through a couple pages, and then you're like, ha ha, that was Enron's values. Um, but the point was, <laughs> they, they could have described anything, right? Like it could have been an auto manufacturer, it could have been a bank, it could have been a tech company. Um, so one of the things we tried to do was come up with a set of values that, because there's a whole bunch of things that we, everyone would agree are, are valuable, like honesty or fair play or something like that. Um, but we felt like uniquely identified Slack, that, that you wouldn't read them and say, oh, that could be anyone. Um, and craftsmanship and, and playfulness, I think are, we'll use those two examples. Um, one is, it's, I think it's very important, not just to the ultimate product that you're selling to customers and the experience that customers have, but to the experience of working at a place that you are encouraged to or allowed to exhibit craftsmanship, that take care in your work. To do something in a shoddy or sloppy way because there's some rush or um, mandate from the company to, to cut corners creates an environment that is less good. I mean, it's like, it's not as fun to work there, it's not as engaging, you don't, you know, like I mentioned earlier all the Dilbert office space stuff. You know, another thing that I think really is a challenge for a lot of people is the feeling that um, they have so much more to offer than they're being called on to, to give in the role that they have, and I think it can be a real point of frustration, so that's the craftsmanship side. And playfulness sounds like a bizarre one, I think, to a lot of people, but there's this, um, you know, being able to look at the world sideways and to be creative, I think, requires an element of playfulness. And um, those of you who have dogs or like dogs or have hung out with dogs before might recognize this thing that dogs do where they put their front paws down like, like that and put their head down and they're 100% engaged and ready to spontaneously react to whatever it is that you're about to do. And you can pretend to throw the ball or like waggle your hand or, or do pretty much anything and they're gonna react. And that, that stance of playfulness I think is one that is really important to maintain even in a corporate environment um, so that we uh, ensure that we explore the whole creative landscape and find creative solutions. Well, it, it's incredible what you've built and what you, uh, what, what, what you are building. Congratulations on, uh, on, the, on, the, on the Slack story. Uh, we're just about out of time here. And before we go, I'd like to mention that as a token of our appreciation, a donation is being made on Stuart's behalf to, uh, to an organization called Code for America's Clear My Record program. Wondering if you can share a few words on why you uh, selected that charity. Um, we recently started um, a program called The Next Chapter, so it's Slack, um, the Kellogg Foundation, um, which is um, based in Michigan and has a commitment to um, improving lives for children, but they recognize that children are part of communities and there's a lot of communities in the United States that are disproportionately affected by criminal justice issues. Um, an organization called The Last Mile, which is based in the Bay Area and that teaches coding inside of prisons. They started off in San Quentin, which sounds kind of scary, but San Quentin's actually like one of the nicest uh, and most desirable state prisons to be in. So they're starting to spread from San Quentin into like tougher um, kinds of, of prisons. And I went there to visit them and it was like, oh man, they don't, like a lot of these people went to jail, or went to prison before Facebook, before um, iPhones and they don't have access to the internet and they're trying to learn to be software engineers in an environment where they don't have those devices, they don't have access to the internet, and they don't have direct experience, and so the accomplishments are, are pretty remarkable. And this is a long explanation, I'm sorry. Uh, Slack, Kellogg Foundation, Last Mile, and then uh, John Legend, um, the entertainers, organization called Free America. So we came together to create apprenticeship opportunities for formerly incarcerated people. So uh, people who go through some training uh, um, outside of Slack, but that are given opportunities for um, automated QA software engineering jobs inside of the company. It's pretty experimental, um, but there's a, a pretty broad um, sentiment inside the company to do what we can to um, support people. And, and there's a broader mission to increase the representation of people who have been traditionally underrepresented in the technology industry. This is a group that is very underrepresented in the technology industry, and um, Code for America is a fantastic organization. Um, I have a lot of friends who work there. And the Clear My Record program, I think, is really important because, um, you know, for example, uh, marijuana is now legal in California, and there's a lot of people who have criminal records as a result of possession charges for marijuana who can't vote, who can't get jobs, who can't rent apartments. Um, and in many cases, um, those records can be expunged, 
but they don't know that. And um, the idea of like knowing which building to go at what time and line up and fill out which form is something that's really difficult. And I think it's made, I'm not sure if it might be over characterizing to say it's deliberately made to be more difficult for these people, but it's very complex. And so Code for America is developing programs to make it as easy as possible, to make it as close to like one touch as possible for people to get what they're legally entitled to, which is those records cleared. Well, I think you may have inspired a future disruptors on disrupting the criminal justice system. It's an important issue that you've taken on, so thank you for that. Thank you to our audience and uh, to all the folks watching on WebEx and uh, Facebook, especially the gang in Winnipeg who have joined us as a, uh, a team. If you want to uh, continue with the conversation, follow us on social media, hashtag uh, RBC Disruptors or through uh, RBC Connect. And Stuart, again, congratulations on all you've been building at uh, Slack, and uh, thanks for joining us at RBC. Thank you.